So now I'll, um, our next speaker uh, is Anand Tamboli. Um, he's the CEO of Anand Tamboli and Company. Uh, and um, he is a serial entrepreneur, speaker, award-winning author, innovation and transformation specialist. And um, his many roles include being a principal advisor uh, to AI Australia and an author and reviewer of the AI and Ethics Journal. And he's going to be talking about the maze of technology ethics. Um, so hi there, Anand. Can you hear us? Yes, absolutely, loud and clear. Okay, that's great. Um, so again, if anyone's got any questions, um, feel free to post them in the chat and we'll, we'll answer them at the end. Uh, but um, yeah, do, do you want to share your slides, Anand, or are you... Yep, you're ready? put it through the video. Okay, okay, that's great. All right, go for it. Cool. <clears throat> So good morning, everyone. Good morning from the sunny Sydney. And uh, look, today uh, I wanted to talk about technology ethics, but then I thought, okay, what should be the name of my speech? What should be the title of my speech? And if you have read the title, it sounds pretty long mouthful, solving the maze of technology ethics. But really, if you have to look at what this a topic is about and the first question is okay is it about ai ethics probably yes it's a little bit about that or ethical ai just the same right or is it about responsible ai there's a lot of talk happening around responsible ai etc so it does cover some of those aspects but in general it also covers about technology ethics but if you really look at it whether it's ai ethics ethical ai responsible ai etc all of these things are, in, in summary, if you have to summarize in a very layperson terms, we are talking about being considerate. As a technologist, as an individual, as a person who is working in the API ecosystem or a technology ecosystem, we want to be considerate, right? Because being considerate means we are taking into account not just the business requirements, not just the business goals, but also the customer societal requirements, environmental requirements, number of other things. And that's when the products that we develop, that's when the solutions that we develop become more sustainable, more useful in the coming, uh, in the upcoming future. Now, and why do I believe this? Because every single technologist, every single developer, project manager, architect, no matter who you are within this technology ecosystem, each and every one of you have the power. Each one of you contributes to it. Each one of you makes it move and grow. And that's why you have this power. I remember when uh, I moved, when I was a child and we moved from a small village to a town, I have never seen cars before doing that. And as I moved to the town, uh, just all the, all the way you start seeing cars and big vehicles, and I was quite amazed at like, how do cars move? Because as a kid, you only see the steering wheel and you feel that, okay, it is just a steering wheel that controls the entire car. And I would ask my, I would pester my father as to how does car move? How does it work, etc. He would go and keep answering me. And once he explained me all the mechanics, whatever he could explain that, look, there is a gearbox, there's a gear lever, there's an accelerator, brake and clutch. And he went on talking about it. And I still had a question. I had a question that, look, it doesn't make sense. You have an accelerator and you have a brake. How does that work together? Because accelerator lets you go faster and brakes stop you, so why do we need both? And his answer, although it was very simple, straightforward answer, that made me think. And the answer was straightforward. He said, look, brakes in the car, their function is to slow you down. But the purpose is to enable you to go faster. As in the brakes in the car do not stop you, do not slow you down. They enable the car to go faster. If, and you, you could just imagine if your car doesn't have a brake, you wouldn't dare to go faster, right? 
because of the brakes, you are able to go faster. You have that confidence that I can go faster. But then what has happened over the last number of years, we have kind of lost that idea. We have moved so fast. And there are a number of companies who have moved fast and broken things. Broken things to a point that there are societal impacts, environmental impacts, physical impacts, whatnot. And APIs per se, so in, in API ecosystem, what happens is every time you release an API, there are tens of or hundreds of APIs that get affected by it. And so it, in a positive way, in a complicated way as well. So API ecosystem is truly adding and supporting into the exponential growth of tech. There's no doubt about it. And I know one of our colleagues earlier said that uh, earlier software was eating the world, but now APIs are eating software. And so that's the rate of change. That's the speed at which things are changing. And in this particular situation, in this fast moving ecosystem, if you have to develop a, a sustainable product, a great product, how do we do that? How do we become, how do we not become reckless? How do we pay attention to the consequences and still develop extend a great product? And I think there are three key factors that I've realized over this number of years as I worked in ecosystem, three key factors that really help you develop such a great product. And the first fundamental requirement to doing that is your product has to do the right thing, right? Uh, I know this is really basic and fundamental for a lot of us. We think that, oh, aren't we all doing the right thing? And yes, that is why it's not really a big question as to whether your product does the right thing. It's always, we take it for granted that people do have right intentions on, so the product is doing the right thing. But the second key aspect here is doing it right. And for last two days, so yesterday and today, with number of streams, you have learned doing that and there is enough information available in the marketplace on the internet as to how to develop a software or a solution in a right way right the best practices and how to guide there there is enough information so even that point is covered now what is not covered is this third missing circle the third missing circle is controlling the risk controlling all kinds of risk and this is where i think the problem starts because lots of organizations think that this risk is all about project this risk is all about uh, in, in many cases, financial risk. And they try to put in frameworks, they try to put in some policies around it. And the problem that is, is, you know, it's a policy. You can't really execute a policy without having a proper framework. And that's where I think the issue starts. That we need this, if you want to develop a great five-star product, then we need to cover all these three aspects. And part of that is being able to establish a framework that helps you cover those risks and not just the financial or a business risk, but also risks that are as a that are coming as an unintended consequence towards your customers, towards the society, industry as such, overall ecosystem, because we can't just look at it from technological standpoint. So the question is again, why do we need those frameworks? Right, and I remember I when I used to work in banking for a long time, a couple of banks I worked in, and there were a number of cases with money laundering, and we know how uh, pesky that could be. And every time money laundering case would, there would be an incident about money laundering, people blame banks. People blame banks not because they were criminally uh, complicit in money laundering, but they blame banks because banks did not take care enough with their infrastructure, whatever the mechanism, the machinery they provided to prevent that from happening, to, to arrest those money laundering transactions. They, had not, they did not have enough uh, ecosystem built around, enough controls built around. And I think with, with the API ecosystem, it is now incumbent upon us, as a technology ecosystem, it is also incumbent upon us, to build similar kind of controls. Because who knows, like we have a good ecosystem, but then someone somewhere is probably not doing the right thing, or maybe they are not doing it right, 
or maybe they're just being reckless, trying to move fast, break things. And that's where if we don't have those controls in place at an ecosystem level, probably we, we're going to suffer a lot. So as an ecosystem, we have to push for those changes. But also now you, the question is, how can an individual contribute to it? How as a developer, or how as a project manager, you can do something? Because at a high level, it's always the uh, policy and all that stuff happens. But how do we do it uh, as an individual? And that's where I think when, when the product management, product design process has those ethical aspects, the, the consequential aspects embedded in, in the process, in the process of the design, in the process of development, deployment, training, etc., then it becomes easier. So let me give you an example. Like there is a uh, there is a technique called as a pre-mortem analysis. Now, pre-mortem analysis is theoretical or exact opposite of post-mortem. So if you have heard of the term, uh, how many of you watch aircraft investigation? And if you watch that, you see that. There's a meticulous methodical uh, investigation that goes on when the plane crash happens. And then eventually they come up with the solution as to why it happened and how it can be prevented. But it's too late. It's a post-mortem. So something has already gone wrong and then you start investigating. So that still is required. But what we also require is a preventive mechanism. And that's when the pre-mortem analysis come into picture where you basically envisage a scenario, all the possible scenarios during the process of design, deployment, training, back, et cetera. And all those scenarios are played out from a risk standpoint, from ethical standpoint. And if you identify a gap well in advance, the objective is to fix and fill those gaps. You don't have to wait for something to go wrong. You can do it earlier. So if you look at how the, the development process in general we go through, like, and it doesn't have to be just the API, but any AI-based project or any machine learning or advanced project does go through uh, these steps. So first we start with the design, then we have a training, and the training almost always fits in with the training data. Then we go through the deployment phase where the project starts to implement the solution, and that's when uh, we see lots of issues because it's not just your solution, but your solution is interacting, your API is interacting with a number of other APIs, heterogeneous systems. And then actually the user starts implementing using those products, the feedback comes in. And that feedback goes back into your training mechanism to adjust to, to fine tune the system. Now, I remember when I was working with uh, one of the telcos in Australia, they did develop a incident management robot or RPA solution. It wasn't RPA, but it's like RPA plus ML plus something. So it's a hybrid. And somehow they missed the design aspect wherein one of the core key criteria as to why the robot should hand over the, the job to the human operator uh, was missed, so there was a design failure. Yet, they, they trained uh, the robot on the data that was deployed, and again, in the deployment phase, they did not pay much attention. And because they did not pay much attention, there were a number of other APIs, other software that were linked to their systems, and not within just within the company, but also within the, with the downstream suppliers and upstream suppliers, uh, downstream consumers and upstream suppliers, they also have softwares linked. And because they were not compatible, or in some cases the assumptions were different, it started to break the whole operation, which created additional work for human operators to fix. And the whole fiasco basically resulted into $11 million of a loss over the period of uh, a year. It's not really a uh, pleasant story, right? And why? Because they, they, they did not do the pre-mortem analysis for sure, but they, they basically went in one direction. They did, there was no feedback loop. There was no mechanism to control those risks. There was no mechanism to even envisage those risks. And that's where this pre-mortem does help. 
in finding those things. And in pre-mortem, there are basically three different categories, uh, three different criteria you need to look at. And you could apply pre-mortem to any of these six steps. So whether it's a design, deployment, training, data collection, feedback, you could apply pre-mortem to each of those steps separately. Uh, now, so in that pre-mortem, what happens is, let's, let's take an example with the robot. You say that this robot is gonna take an incident data, look at it, analyze it, run some tests, and based on the results, it's going to identify despite the technician or it's going to give it to a human operator. If that's the step in your process, in your design or in operation, how can it go wrong? And this question has to be asked well in advance with the cross-functional team sitting in. You say, okay, how, in how many ways this step can go wrong? And you list down all those steps. And then the next question is, well, if the first step goes wrong, how severe it could be? Is it extremely bad, hazardous or, or lethal to something barely annoying? And then more the higher the severity, you say it's a 10, a lower the severity, it's a one. Then the next question is, well, if how often this is gonna happen? How often this failure would happen? And you might say, well, it might happen once in a while. And depending upon the subject matter knowledge, you would say, is it a uh, very high occurrence that is 10, or is it rare occurrence that is one? The third one is detection. And that's where the scale reverses, because the idea is, if you can detect something quickly, you can fix it. So higher the detection of that failure, lower the rating, right? And lower the detection, higher the rating. Because if you can't detect, and if it's too late, it has got a bigger problem. And when you have this S, O, and D, you multiply them, you get RPN, or risk priority number, or risk score. That score gives you objective proof, objective numbering for each of your steps all the steps that your solution is going to do. And now you know which step is critical, where I need to pay more attention, how do I control uh, that, that step, or how do I control any uh, artifacts or consequences coming out of it. And that's where you start to manage your risk more effectively. Because like it or not, if we don't manage it at that level, it's a always post-mortem situation that's nobody's going to like it and the way we the technology is moving faster is going to be a nightmare if we start losing on the input part the meaning uh, means part of the equation now when we do this when we uh, do this sod uh, rpn etc the, the pre-mortem analysis what happens is you essentially get this numbering and you can benchmark and focus your attention towards the critical processes and in doing that you become more confident because if you have fixed, if you have covered all the risk, the confidence level is higher that my solution is not going to break. If it breaks, I know how to fix it. Everything is laid down. And well, uh, if you want to uh, download the format of the pre mortem itself, if you want to read more about pre mortem, because I can't cover that in 20 minute talk, but uh, you can always go down to the link here. It's a bit, bitly link, API underscore PMA. You'll find more details on it. It's a good tool, everybody can use it, very simple to use, it just needs deep questioning. Now, <clears throat> so when we do this, when we do this analysis, and having those numbers, the metric, and this gives us a confidence, this gives us a quite confidence. And doing this means we are marching in the right direction. Now, I know a lot of you might be asking this question, and I often get asked this question, look, if you have to do all of this, this is going to stifle innovation. This is just going to slow us down. It is, it's too much to do, right? It's not, it doesn't really fit into it. And that's when I think I have to ask this question one more time as to brakes in the car, do they slow you down or let you go faster? Remember about that and then start using pre-mortem as many times as you can because eventually, and when I uh, talk to lots of startups or newcomers here, they have a very different vision. They say that we, we want to work with a company that has got a very high social quotient, ethical quotient, and, and all that. So you see, 
any organization that has got this high ethical capacity is going to have a great advantage in near future. So that we need to always keep in mind and we need to work towards building a sustainable product. We need to work building towards a product that is not just the technology marvel, but also something that three years down the line, five years down the line, when we look at the product that we did, that we developed, we should be proud of. We should love that. We should say that, look, I did the right thing. I did it right. And I managed to avoid any unintended consequences, true to my knowledge. In order to do that, I think we have to be cautious because uh, eventually what happens is technology always brings us two things. Technology brings us promise, promise of prosperity, promise of growth, but technology also brings, along with the, the promise, it also brings the consequences. And I think this is the part we, we miss a lot, the consequences part, whether it's intended, unintended, we always miss that part. So I think we need to be more conscious about these consequences. We need to be considerate about these consequences. So here's my straightforward two-word message. Be, con be considerate because eventually you have this power. Thank you so much. Hi there, Anand. Thanks so much for that talk. That was. Um really interesting. Sorry, maybe we've lost an end there, have we? We'll try and get him back. Um, but um, yeah, I think he was, he was making some very interesting points there um, with the analogy of the um, car and the, and the brakes on the car uh, to um, doing this uh, consideration of ethics um, at an early stage um, as part of a pre-mortem um, process. Um, so if anyone's got any questions, feel free to post them into the uh, into the chat. I think we're about to get Ivan back, uh, to get Anand back uh, now, so he should be available um, to answer them. Yes, I should be back. Can you hear me? Can you see me? I, I can hear you, Anand, but I can't see you. Um, but anyway, maybe we can right. still have a discussion. We'll try to yes, try to get your vision your vision back, but anyway, at least we've got you on the voice. Um, so yeah, thanks so much um, for that session, and yeah, that's a great analogy um, in terms of the the brakes on the car. Um, and um, it seems like I think your key point was at an early stage, um, product leads kind of uh, doing this pre mortem process to detect possible ethical um, issues. Um, and I, one question that I had was that um, who needs to be in that kind of when when you're doing that, like in order to be sensitive to potential ethical issues, who 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 needs to be in that cross-functional team, or how do product leads sort of um, get that awareness of, oh, okay, you know, they, this is an issue. There are ethical issues here that need to be considered. Right. <clears throat> So this is uh, often a often a common question, like who in the cross-functional team needs to be right? Mm. And I think we focus a lot on the the technological cross-functionality, as in uh, different technologies, people knowing different things, the testing and etc. But we also need to have people uh, who who don't know nothing about technology, mm. and for good reason, because uh, it, it's it's so difficult for us as a technologist to see the forest for the trees. Yeah. Because we're so yeah. deep into technology. So we need someone who doesn't know the technology. We need someone like, it could be a social scientist, for instance. It could be a philosopher. I mean, mm. I, I don't mean to be having a hardcore philosopher, but people who at least know how technologies create that impact somewhere in the society and how people use it how people respond to certain technological functions. And once they have that feedback, there is there is a good check and balance that can be maintained. Mm. So yeah. have someone who who is not close to the technology. Yeah, yeah. And are there particular companies that you think are doing this well, um, or, or at least better than, you know, better than other ones? Um, 
Well, uh, companies are catching up. I would say uh, there's there's no ideal or say front runner per se. A lot of companies have established boards, so it's pr pretty early stage. So a lot of companies, you know, uh, they say that we have an ethical uh, committee, a board that oversees the governance of uh, technology developments, yeah. but they're still grappling to get it to an execution level wherein they can uh, they can rely on team members to go and do it be confident without having too much of an intervention from the leadership yep 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 um and what about so i mean the the speaker that we had pr immediately previous to you i don't know if you got to hear um his talk um at all or not it was daniel, daniel. yeah bernardi did you hear his talk uh barely i mean i, I didn't finish completely you were yeah, you were probably preparing yeah. for your own yeah. one, but he he was talking about um, the new, uh, I think three new APIs that Twitter's um, developed to try to promote healthier conversations. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of there's a, been a problem on Twitter. I think with people, you know, having abusive replies to people's treats or. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, and now Twitter's introduced these three new APIs, one to annotate uh, tweets, a conversation ID one, and a, also a hide reply. So it's kind of like a machine learning intelligent uh, ability to detect like abusive tweets and hide ones which, you know, you the user kind of wants to hide. Um, what do you think about that approach? Like, is that a good is that a good example of a company sort of stepping up and taking um, taking ethical? It's a good start, I would say, because you know uh, the, the, we we know a case of Tay, right? A Tay chatbot from Microsoft. Just just the latest example, I think 2016, when Tay was released on Twitter. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And just within 24 hours, it just gone wild and racist and whatnot. It, so it was this learning. Is definitely a good step. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember. I remember reading about that. Yeah. So um, this is definitely a good step, as in from doing the right thing and uh, doing it right. Mm. Uh, probably they will have to see how it goes with, in terms of the consequences as to if they have missed something or if, if there is something that was never thought about, but this happening or people are using it in a very nifty and fancy ways now. To bypass it's, it, but. <laughs> it's kind of interesting there. I mean, because the, I think previously it's a move from, say, human moderators that you know have been used in some places, like maybe Facebook or that kind of thing, to actually using machine learning or AI to enforce the um, ethical standards in a way. So it's kind of an interesting development. Yes, it is. And look, there's, there's still a risk. I mean, I don't uh, say that it's 100% foolproof because, again, whoever is coding into that model, uh, their understanding or their belief of this is okay and this is not okay as a collective decision, the collective understanding always goes into that model. So mm -hmm. what you think is right probably may not be right in certain parts of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a huge issue. Different ethical kind of approaches, maybe in, de you know, depending on your culture or or background, uh, issues might be a, a little different. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, thanks so much for your talk. So yeah, that was a great. The key point about uh, kind of anticipating these eth ethical issues, um, doing a pre mortem, looking at severity, occurrence, detection, working out this risk score. Uh, sounds like something that everyone can um, can consider. We've got one question there. We've only we've got very little time left, but I'll quickly go to it. Is the pre mortem analysis mm -hmm. a widely used approach? If not, any reason? This is from Gregory Bell. 